with impact, it's not enough to say I'm creating jobs, I'm working with smallholder farmers. People need to see the data. I think the universities or institutions of higher learning have got to review how they operate. How do you manage your processes, or your costs in order to be more efficient? We've come up with a toolkit that then we share with the universities. We have what we call the E4 Impact Pan-African Alliance, which is an alliance of universities. Hello and welcome to this edition of the ASEC Member Spotlight. Today our guest is Isabella Tanai of E4 Impact. She's going to be telling us about E4 Impact and how they are creating socially impactful businesses. Isabella, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. How are you doing today? Good, very good. Excited. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start off with the first question. Briefly give us a brief background of E4 Impact Accelerator and your role in the company. All right, so the E4 Impact Accelerator has been around since 2017 and we came into being because of a gap that we saw as we were implementing the MBA program that we we are offering in collaboration with Tangaza University. So we had entrepreneurs who wanted to learn more about um, business, but they didn't have the academic qualifications. And we realized there's something that we could do in, in this space. So that's how the accelerator came into being. And we got support from the Italian corporation together with any. So I run the accelerator, I'm the accelerator manager. Okay, and uh, how, what services do you offer? Okay, so we offer a myriad of services. Um, one is, of course, the capacity building in the form of training, coaching, and mentorship. And um, the training is really customized because we have enterprises that then come in their 20, 25 years in business. Others are three, four years into business. So you sort of need to address their gaps depending on where they are in the continuum. Um, we also do this through offering them um, services, professional services, and we have this in four ways. We offer them legal services, we have marketing, accounting, and something that we believe is very, very important for enterprises to, to learn more about. Um, this is the business processes and systems. So how do you manage your processes, or your costs in order to be more efficient and offer something that really the customers need? So this is done in two ways. We do it as a training directly and also as a direct service to, to the entrepreneurs that we have. The other thing we offer is um, market and financial linkages, both uh, regionally, um, locally, and also internationally. So in the past two cohorts, we really supported some of our entrepreneurs to raise external funds out of the grants that we offer to about uh, slightly over 2 million euros. And we're hoping to continue building on that. Um, as I mentioned, we do offer grants and these grants are really to de-risk the businesses. Also, I think when you have a business that is able to demonstrate that it can receive funds, utilize, it's a, it's a show of confidence to an investor. So it's sort of a catalyst for our entrepreneurs. We also partnered with um, two different organizations. One is Standard Media Group. They help us in terms of visibility and also um, outside of visibility for the program is to feature the enterprises that we have because, you know, we deal a lot with impact businesses. So it means they're solving problems, societal challenges. And sometimes, you know, being that they're societal um, driven, they might not get the platform to showcase what it is. So Standard has been very useful for this. The other thing we partnered with um, is um, OpenNet. This is an Italian telco company um, specialized in satellite technology. So with this partnership, we were able to assist the businesses that could use space technology to enhance their market. And uh, with the uptake, really what was interesting is mostly um, the agri companies are the ones that really benefited from, from this. We had about uh, four deployments of the same. Then we also support them in terms of talent recruitment and all matters HR um, and also where we are sitting, it's a co-working space. So if you need space for your team, if you need to host meetings, this is this space is available for you. So how do you cost your services based on, because you said you do support different uh, levels of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. how do you cost your services and uh, the marketing? Like for instance, if I was a small company and I had probably two people in my team, is it different from a person who has 20 people in their team? Are the services cost it differently? That's interesting. Um, as a startup ourselves, <laughs> as, a, as an accelerator, 
Um, the program has been uh, subsidized for the entrepreneurs. So it means if you come into the program, regardless of whether you have the two employees or the 20, you will not pay for the program. Because as I mentioned, it was uh, sponsored by the Italian corporation in, in Kenya. So the only commitment for you then at that point is, you know, you're committing your time and just the expenses of getting to the program. But for now, it wow. is, it's, it's, uh, it's fully subsidized for the entrepreneurs. That's impressive. How many entrepreneurs have you worked with in your team? Okay, so this is the core program that we have. We take in 20 entrepreneurs for um, a period of 12 months. Okay. And up to now, we've run two successful cohorts. So that would be 40 entrepreneurs. But outside of this, I think within the first year of being in the space, we had partners who were knocking at our doors. We like the way you're training the entrepreneurs. You're speaking to what is um, dear to us. You're looking at impact. Can you sort of train this group for us? So we've managed to run a number of um, in short incubation and pre like acceleration programs for different partners. Uh, we've done one for renewable energy uh, entrepreneurs in the biogas sector. I think we trained about 40 in two cohorts. We've also run, um, we're running actually a program with uh, more incubation for the youth who are interested in venturing into entrepreneurship. And we're working with 20 entrepreneurs. We are running something with the National Environment Trust Fund, working with about 10 entrepreneurs. So outside of the core, we've actually had other acceleration programs. So I would look at uh, slightly over 100, and that is not mentioning the other programs that we also, as the accelerator, support the, e, the foundation in implementing um, donor-funded projects. Ah, and how many consultants do you have in your team? So as I mentioned, through the professional services, then we have those teams that we have on board for the duration of the program, because sometimes you know, as an entrepreneur, something comes up, you've got in a deal, you need to speak to a lawyer. So we sort of have a retainer with all these consultants. And then internally, we have a team of about six people supporting the entrepreneurs. And that is just the team that sits here in Kenya. We also have counterparts sitting in Milan who are helping us in terms of identifying market opportunities, investors, and also serve as coaches to the entrepreneurs. Hmm, that's quite impressive. Why is it important for entrepreneurs to have social, socially impactful businesses? What is the reason, like, why is this important? That's a very good question. And I think also the way the world is moving, the problems, the challenges that we are seeing every day, we believe entrepreneurship is the tool, is the vehicle that really can help solve the societal challenges that we're facing. So it's good to run a for-profit business because at the end of the day, if you look at it, it's giving somebody employment. Hopefully it's paying slightly better than what the market treats as. But looking at um, impact entrepreneurship, you're looking at your environment, the problems, the challenges that the people within your environment are going through. So is it garbage? Is it the fact that um, agricultural production has dropped? Is it uh, youth who are unemployed? And looking like, how do I solve this challenge while still being sustainable and creating impact in the long term? So, you know, you do good business and doing good in the long run. So it's a win-win as opposed to, you know, I'm running a for-profit business, which we say it's not bad, but it's only benefiting a select few. So moving from um, what we say, the shareholders to stakeholders um, economy. Yeah, so it's, um, it's type of a certification and also a way to verify yourself because when you're able to do the sustainable uh, projects, people are able to gain trust in you, isn't it? True, true. They gain trust, but also believing in the fact that I can do something that is solving a problem while creating something good for myself. Your livelihood is increasing, but you know, it's like a double-edged uh, sword of advantages. Yeah. It's a win-win for everybody. How have you been able to support entrepreneurs to be impactful, socially impactful? Okay, so um, when we're doing our recruitment, um, we have four very simple criteria when we're selecting, right? Mm -hmm. You need to be in a team. Yeah. We've had challenges with working with one-man um, shoes. It's not possible to run the business and be actively involved in an acceleration program. So we work with teams mostly. 
um, you need to be post revenue and um, you need to have something innovative in the market. You're already selling something. You may not be post profit, but you're already in the market. And more importantly, your business, you can be able to demonstrate the impact. So sometimes you find a business that really is um, socially um, driven, but they've not started looking at those metrics. How do I communicate the impact? Because now with impact uh, investors coming into the space, there's a way in which you need to speak that language. There are certain metrics and numbers that you need to present. So we have um, training sessions that really specify on the issues of social impact measurement. How do you measure? How do you track? How do you document? How do you communicate? So we have that. And for this, we've also we are partnering up with B-Lab for to support some entrepreneurs, particularly in our next um, call, to be certified to be B Corp um, uh, businesses. So that's one of the things that we've also done. And in, on top of that is just um, ensuring when you talk about impact um, and creating a database of impact investors that we can say, hey, look, we have these entrepreneurs who can speak or speak to your mission. How do we sort of work together to ensure that, you know, they're supported to get to the next level to amplify their impact? Mm, that's interesting. And uh, now just drawing from that. Many business students uh, graduate from university, but are unable to set up impactful mm -hmm. businesses, which is sustainable. Why is this the case and where are we experiencing a skill gap? Is it in the theoretical teaching in universities or is it in the practical teaching when it comes to business and entrepreneurship training programs, especially um, not even just on the MBA level, even the degree level. The undergraduate. It's true. It's true. And I think it's a challenge that a lot of people in this space have highlighted. Um, but with this, we are starting to see a bit of change with the universities. Um, one is outside of even saying, OK, you know, sometimes the training, I'm sure if you went back to the university, you most likely you will find what you went through, you know, like what I went through a few years back. It's probably the same content they're still using. Yes. Even looking at the dynamics of today, a lot of the things are digital. Why aren't we embracing all these things? Like even look at last year um, when the country was in a shutdown, I mean, globally. And um, universities were closed. Why are we closed if we are even trying to say we want to move to digital? It was a bit interesting to see some of the um, primary schools trying to teach the younger ones virtually, but universities are closed. It, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's just not right. You know, we cannot be doing that. So what is it that we need to start thinking? One, I think the universities or institutions of higher learning have got to review how they operate. If you're really trying to, be, to build up a population that can be digitally savvy, and you know now we are all connected, but if you have people who are not able to communicate, how are we going to do that? Secondly, is to move a bit away from the theoretical. You know, you sit in class and then they will tell you, you have three months of internship out of four years. It is not sufficient, you know. Yeah. If you look at um, universities um, in, in Europe or, or even in, 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 in America, it's more of a practical setting. You're learning from an industrial perspective and the theory will come in now so that you can tie what it is that you're doing practically. So we need to start moving away from just sitting and, you know, a, a facilitator coming to lecture you for two, four hours. <laughs> it, I think also that mode of delivery. Let's let's look at these people who are coming in. I mean, you're taking a certain course because you have an interest. You're not starting from zero. So how do we have that engaging learning um, with, with the students? The other thing is, you know, we do, especially at the master's level, you'd find the universities, you do a thesis, you have a project and engineering. And sometimes those are very amazing, amazing ideas. But how do you move these ideas from just a thesis to something that can be tested? You know, it's interesting, but is it viable? Can we prototype? What do we we do next what but to give them a bit of credit i've seen a bit of shift if i even think of what Igaton are trying to do what more university are trying to do with the program that we're implementing with them they are picking on alumni current students who have interesting ideas and say okay can we sort of see if they can be converted to viable businesses and, and the other thing that I've seen and, and um, being done by BioInnovate, they're trying to look at um, solutions, bio um, solutions in the market. And these are also largely drawn from the universities, the research. How do we bring all these great ideas from the university into the market? So I think there's also need for the universities to 
stop thinking in silos and really coordinate because you're churning people out into the market and they're not well prepared for the market or they're not coming with what the market needs or what the industry needs. So how do we work together? And and, and for this, I also see um, there's an institute in um, St. Kizito. They're now working directly with the industries, training electricians. So what is it that you do you need? How do we train them? You know, can you come and train them? So can we start thinking as opposed to saying it has to be a professor offering a certain course? Get a technician to come and offer that course. Yes, you, you get yeah, exactly the practical bit of it is what's more important. important. At the end of the day, it's yeah. not the books. I mean, you know, with all the jokes that Kenyans make of the Pythagoras theory, <laughs> when are you using it? So really let's 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 communicate with the market, the industry, so that by the time we are getting our students out, they're really ready for these opportunities. And also we could have partnerships uh, to that effect with actually now training institutions, not just training institutions, but basically uh, institutions that are set up. For instance, if you're doing MassCon, you can be attached and there can be a partnership with a broadcasting station. If you're, doing, if you're doing business, you can be attached to one of CAM, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. then they will be able to experience and know how to deal with the challenges as they come not that the challenge is coming and they're like i, I don't know what to do yeah but also the problem is you know when you think about our, our facilitators in the university these are people who were trained back in the day so sometimes also to teach a new and old dog new tricks is, is a problem but we've got to open up and see what are the new ways that we can really offer value for, for to the students okay and uh, how do you collaborate with other businesses in creating impactful programs apart from the partnership you've mentioned with build up which other um which other institutions do you partner with so that you can offer socially impactful Oh, okay, so other than what I mentioned with, with B-Lab is um, we try to work with the different universities saying, okay, and, and just to mention the accelerator here, you know, has been like our lab for, for E4 for Impact. So we make our mistakes here, we make our learnings here and say, okay, this has worked. We are, we've come up with a toolkit that then we share with the universities. We have what we call the E4 Impact Pan African Alliance, which is an alliance of universities across Africa. And we have about 18 um, countries on board for this. You see, you know, the most logical step where for a university, if, especially if you're really trying to support and promote entrepreneurship, is giving the, these people a place where they can come and learn. You know, just to figure out what is this idea? Is it going to be viable? What could be the business model? Who do I need to talk to? You know, so we have this toolkit that we share with the universities like, okay, you use this. This is what has worked here and we can tweak it to, to suit your environment. That's one. The other thing is, um, again, trying to look at the mode of delivery that we offer with the, uh, the accelerator and sort of stepping it down to see um, for some of the projects that we are implementing and we do implement um, donor funded projects is how do we then sort of take the accelerator seated here in Nairobi and replicate it in West Pokot or Isiolo, where we, we actually have two projects running. So in, in a way, it's not like the impact can only be held in, in, in where we are seated in Nairobi, because I think being in the, in, the, in the capital, a lot of things are happening. But how do we scale that down to ensure that somebody who's seated in, in the village can be able to access the content or even the opportunities that are available, and then therefore trying to create linkages. And, and that's something that we've seen working very well for us. For the entrepreneurs that we have and trained in different programs, how do we sort of create that sort of uh, tripartite relationship with others and you sort of help them or, or if they can be your suppliers, are you able to mentor them? So that's something else that we are, we've explored and we've seen actually some very good collaborations coming out of that. What barriers do you think stand in the way of Kenyan entrepreneurs creating socially impactful businesses and how can we shift the narrative from, profit, um, from profitable businesses to impactful businesses? And do you think that the government is doing, like is heavily invested in socially impactful businesses at this time? Do you think that there's something that the government can do and can step in to actually accelerate this process okay i start with your the first question about um what are the barriers one with impact it's not enough to say i'm creating jobs i'm working with smallholder farmers people need to see the data and one challenge that we have in kenya in africa is just the data how do we collect the data? How do we validate that data? How do we share that data or even communicate it? That's one of the challenges that we face. And then also the fact that we have all these frameworks, sometimes we're entrepreneurs are struggling, so which one should I follow? 
um, and, and getting enterprises or organizations that can support and say, okay, if you're looking to follow a certain given standard for you in the renewable sector, this is the most ideal. If you're in agri, this is the best, or even the certifications that you can start working towards to say, okay, you're a socially impactful business. I think those would be very helpful for, 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 for growing the, the impact. Again, um, as you said, with pro for profit businesses, they're good. But how can you also sort of start looking at this for profit and say, okay, I started out as a for profit, but I see um, there's a way in which we can change the business model, we can iterate and start looking at creating more impact. It, it's possible and, and it's been done. And we see a lot of those entrepreneurs who come in to say, you know, I am running a consultancy and it's purely for profit, but they do the MBA and you're told, okay, it's good that you're running a successful business, but how else do you empower somebody else? How do you create impact even using your business? And people start thinking, okay, so maybe I can look at an underserved population and offer some pro bono hours in that way. Sort of just, um, it, it's not too late to start converting or looking to embed um, impact in your, in your business models. In terms of what the government can do, you know, the government is a big machinery that sometimes can move slowly. And, and up to now, um, we have a society, the uh, Social Entrepreneur Society of Kenya, SESOC, and, and we've had a privilege of working with them. And also something I'm happy to say is almost like 95% of their members are alumni of the program we, we run with Tangaza. They've really been um, active in the space trying to say, can we create policy around social entrepreneurship? Because if you were to go and register your business and you say, okay, I'm, a, I'm an impact uh, enterprise, I'm a social enterprise, there's no way you would check to say you're a social enterprise, right? Yeah. Limited by guarantee would probably be the closest. The yes. So how can we sort of just change the narrative to say, okay, uh, the government says this can be looked into. Let us create um, a slot to say there's a social enterprise. Why? Um, two, since you're coming to support, because if you look at social enterprises, they're really doing or supporting the work that is the core mandate of the government, right? If they're offering health facilities, those are things that really lie with the government to, to deliver. So you're sort of complementing or supporting as in implementing. So in return, we will give you some tax relief. You know, these are things that the government can be able to do for, for social enterprises. Or we can be able to give or give a certain percentage of the tenders that are coming for, from government to be specifically for social enterprises, you know. Um, I know there's, there was an initiative where the government was actually being told a certain percentage of their procurement needed to come from the local enterprises, which is a good thing. But how do we enforce and, and make sure that what is actually on paper is being seen? So those are the things that I believe the government can come in to start, you know, creating a, a shake in the, in the in that space just to ensure that you have enterprises that feel okay for our contribution we're really being validated by the government i, I think it becomes a win-win at the end of the day you have enterprises that are growing but also communities around that are being empowered in the process very true and um, which uh, now takes me to my other question COVID has hit hard, especially in the entrepreneurship sector. Uh, what support have you as an accelerator been able to give those struggling in the industry, mm -hmm. apart from just um, the entrepreneurs you train, the startups you train, what support has Equal Impact Accelerator been able to, to give? Okay, so when COVID came and, you know, everything was a lockdown, like, you know, even you see our center is still a bit empty. So we, what we managed to do, and we would offer for one was um, free training sessions, meal, and using examples that we've had of, of the entrepreneurs we've worked with. So if you are doing deliveries, how are the things that you can start delivering? Do you still do you need to quickly sort of start looking at uh, virtual platforms to sell your products? And we've actually managed to connect some of our entrepreneurs to say you can be able to sell virtually, you know, move very quickly. That was one. Two, um, last year also, the, the time we usually have an award, it's called the Morati Award, um, one of uh, the, the president of our foundation. And it's usually just to celebrate entrepreneurs. But um, from last year, we said this money needs to go to entrepreneurs who are really struggling or who have come up with very innovative ways of dealing with COVID. You know, so did you manage to pivot your business to respond to COVID? I mean, you know, people who are doing um, fashion or leather, then side making masks, they're doing PPEs. 
or people who are doing irrigation equipment started doing the spraying boats for hospitals or, or airports. So then we had this grant that was given to entrepreneurs and we had um, two winners last year. It's actually been launched um, just this week again and it will, it's still looking at the COVID uh, space. Then the other thing we did is really looking at the relief funds that came into the space and saying, okay, for what is there, who can be able to apply to this? Because it was a, it was a big hit for, for the entrepreneurs. But what I'm very happy and grateful for is despite that very heavy challenge, all our entrepreneurs still have their doors open. So um, so the funds that are in this space, who can we support to quickly apply and utilize the funds to, to sort of keep their doors open? Um, the other thing is um, there were funds that were coming from, from outside and we had actually a number of entrepreneurs, even during that difficult time, who managed to close some very good deals. So very quickly then looking at your documents and matching you to the funds that were available at, the, at that moment. Okay. And uh, what are your hopes for the entrepreneurship space in terms of moving to a socially impactful business? What, what do you hope for in the next 10 years? Okay. First, I might, I must say the idea of having an association of like-minded um, uh, organizations supporting entrepreneurs is great, because you know we everybody has a niche that they are looking at, right? But if we're to leverage on each other and say, okay, you're working predominantly with, with women, I'm working predominantly probably with uh, impact entrepreneurs. How do we? How do I support women who are also impact entrepreneurs and building up on each other's um, strengths? That's one. I think also the fact that then you know you're coming as a united front gives us a more powerful voice to sort of advocate for um, conducive environment for entrepreneurs to come up uh, to to operate a bit more better in the space. I mean, look at the SME bill that came up, and we had a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions about it. You know, even to say it's good, but it can be changed or improved. So the the interaction that um, all the ESOs have had gives us a stronger um, uh, or a validated position also to, to, to advocate for this. The other thing is um, we also happen to be a, a member of, of, of Afri Labs and, and looking at the point where, and I'm hoping we can grow as ASEC to that point where you even are able to attract funds to say, okay, as a group like this, how can you sort of um, scale your trainings to other positions or other locations in the country that do not necessarily have such programs. So I think there would be more value for the ESOs, there's more value for entrepreneurs. And when you have something like that, that is very vocal, is very, um, you know, seen, it's very visible in the market space, and to believe that it would also be something that would challenge the youth to look like, you know, we don't have to all get white collar jobs. I can be an, uh, an, 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 an agricultural person, but also try to make a business. I can be doing my fashion and run it as a business. So I, I, I think then we have a role collectively to play to say, um, how do we look at you know growing or um, developing the economy a bit more using entrepreneurship, not as a last minute resort, but really that it becomes that one thing that people say, you know, kids, you go to school, they will say, I want to be an entrepreneur, not yeah. necessarily a pilot. Adopt. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Isabella. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Want to be featured on the member spotlight? Reach out to us via communications at asic.ke and let us tell your story.